Hello, Pico. Hi. You're an endless bundle of contradictions. I know your bosses at Time Magazine gave up long ago trying to figure you out. I have too. And you're a man who has traveled everywhere, North Korea, Israel, and um, Kathmandu, Cuba. And yet, in your latest book, and on the TED stage, you said, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Stay in one place and go in here. Hmm. What are you thinking? <laughs> Travel is my job. I travel as I go to the office. And as you said, and as you know, I was lucky enough to travel even from the time I was a very small kid. When I was nine years old, I was going to school by plane between California and England. By the time I was 17, I was spending every season on a different um, continent. And so, to some extent, uh, travel is how I make a living, but maybe stillness is how I make a life. And I think that. Travel is how I gather experience, as all of us do when we go to our office, but stillness is how I process it and try to extract the meaning of it and make sense of it and put it on, in a perspective. Uh, I almost think that travel is how I decorate the house of my life, but stillness is how I lay the foundations. And I think really travel for me is only as useful as the stillness that underwrites it. And I speak as a professional traveler, but whoever you are, you all know that as you go through your daily life, you're being bombarded by emotions, experiences, encounters. And it's very hard to process that when you're on the move. It's only when you go back home and sit still and take a deep breath that you can put it in a larger picture and a frame and a context. Uh, so travel is almost the appetizer and the stillness is the main course, I think. And even when you're on the move, it seems like you take extreme steps and eccentric <laughs> steps and radical steps to disconnect and, and keep a little bit of spaciousness. Yes. And I think you might be in this uh, lonely camp of one, especially in this audience. I'll just <laughs> prove it to you. Everyone raise your hand, one hand. Everybody. <coughs> you know, you don't because okay. you're in this camp. <laughs> if you have ever done a Facebook post, lower your hand. Okay, that leaves a very small crowd. If you have ever used a cell phone, put your hand down. Yeah, every hand has gone down. This man has never used a cell phone. Never used a cell phone. Never done a Facebook post. He doesn't drive a car. He doesn't have TV, he understands. Doesn't have a printer at home. Walks most everywhere when he lives in Japan. And if I'm not mistaken, till recently he just had like a very thin dial-up connection. Yes. And yet he's, you're not a recluse so by any stretch of the imagination. I see you in Davos, I see you at TED. You're traveling around the world. How do you even function? Like, <laughs> how does your wife tell you, speak or bring some sushi when you come back home? <laughs> I function thanks to having a very patient and forbearing wife. Uh, and I'm lucky I don't have kids, so I don't need a cell phone in that regard. I've ensured that my aging 83-year-old mother does have a cell phone, so she can reach somebody if she's in need, albeit not me. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we list the things I don't do, we'll be here all day. But really, this is part of a big picture. So, as you know, when I was in my 20s, I was leading the kind of life that is exciting to a 20-year-old. I had an apartment on Park Avenue. I had a 25th floor office in Midtown Manhattan. I had this extremely exhilarating job writing on World Affairs for Time magazine. And yet I was so excited and caught up in the momentum of it that I realized even then I could never step back far enough to realize if it was making me happiest in the deepest way. So when I was 29, I left all that behind and I moved to a single room on the back streets of Kyoto. In those days, no toilet, no telephone and no bed. And then I met my wife and the two of us and our kids moved to where we've been living for 22 years, rented two-room apartment, as you say, with no car, no bicycle, no anything. And it's in order to stretch the day. So it lasts a thousand hours. And I realized I was giving up security and I was giving up a, a decent salary, but I was gaining what I thought I wanted most, which is freedom and time. Yeah. And so um, I wake up and I can work for nine hours. I can play furious games of ping pong. I can talk to my wife. There's still three hours left in a day. And I think everybody in this room is aware that we're living almost at the speed of light rather than the speed of life now and that our pace is more and more dictated by machines, which is a very difficult pace for humans to keep up with. And I shouldn't say this to somebody working at Google, but you know, there's this wonderful <laughs> new uh, field with the term of, or with the name of interruption science. 
And they have found it takes the average person 25 minutes to recover concentration after a single phone call. And yet the average person in a room such as this receives a phone call every 11 minutes. So we're literally never caught up. And the more we try to keep up with the moment, the further we fall behind. And so, seeing this was on the way, I thought that the only way to make sense of this ever more complicated, accelerating world was to step back a little. You know how sometimes you'll walk into a museum, there's a very complicated, tangled canvas. Yeah. You have to step back, further back, and further back, and finally, if you're far enough away, suddenly it clicks into focus, and you can see what it's trying to say to you. And I think that canvas is our lives. And so I felt I couldn't begin to do justice to my life if I was racing from text to email to appointment. And I suppose I also sensed in my 20s that my prejudice is most of us are happiest when we're deeply absorbed in something. Mm -hmm. Listening to a piece of music, watching a movie, having a deep conversation, enjoying an intimate encounter with somebody we love. And very few people are really happy if they're racing from one place to another and out of breath. And if they are happy, they should continue it. But if they're not, they might have to think that our machines are never going to teach us how to get sanity. That's up yeah. to us. Yeah. So before I respond to that, I actually wanted to show the audience what you showed me two weeks ago when we met at <laughs> Google. He had just come back from SAP Labs. He had done a presentation. And he said, let me show you my PowerPoint. And he pulls this thick sheaf of papers <laughs> completely with hand scribble. And then when I pulled my smartphone, he said, let me show you my smartphone. You're carrying well, it with you? Well, actually, it's my iPad, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's not something I recommend to anybody. <laughs> I'm just a creature of the Paleolithic <laughs> age moving backwards into the 13th century. But, you know, <laughs> you're much younger than I, but in 1997, nobody I knew had a, a cell phone. And if my wife wanted me to collect sushi, she would say at the beginning of the day, could you collect sushi when we get home? And if I were meeting her at 5 p.m. in the Marriott, she would show up at 5, and I would show up at 5. And I didn't need to text her saying, it's 4.56, and I'm four minutes away. And she'd text her, 4.58, and I'm two minutes away. And 4.59, and <laughs> somehow... <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> I mean, undistractedness is my greatest luxury. So the fewer interruptions I can have in my day, it seems like the richer and more spacious and the deeper my life is. So it's a selfish thing, but luckily my wife accommodates it. So therefore, what do you make of this point? Because one of the things you told us when we met is that the people you meet in this part of the world, yeah. me included, you yeah. fondly accused us of creating more weapons of mass distraction, as you call it. <laughs> weapons of mass distraction. And yet, you found it ironic and paradoxical. It is seemingly in these kind of organizations also, yeah. there's this pioneering need to take a step back and mindfulness, meditation, yoga, all of this is becoming very popular in a corporate business environment outside of a monastery. Yes. Why do you think that is? So what's your observation? Like when you step back, what did you see? Well, in answer to the first part of your question, the people who are wisest about the limits of technology are people like you and many of the people in this room who are at the forefront of technology. And so I was very impressed that when I go and visit you at Google, not only do I see the Google engineers increase their creativity and productivity by playing beach volleyball, <laughs> taking long walks on the green hills and going into the meditation room or doing yoga, but by observing an, an internet Sabbath. Because they know, and you know, I think, that you need to go offline in order to bring anything fresh and creative back into the online world. And I'm, uh, I'm touched by people who will go totally offline from Friday night to Monday morning so that as soon as they're back into the work cycle, they can come up with the ideas that they would never be able to come up with if they're clicking and twitching and twittering. Yeah. Uh, and you know, Kevin Kelly, one of the great writers about technology and its new possibilities, writes his books about our latest devices with no smartphone, no laptop, and no TV in his home. And I think we should take the lead from people like you, and that's one reason I was so keen to come to Wisdom 2.0, because I do think Many of us have this sensation. We have more and more time-saving devices, less and less time. More and more information, but less and less chance to make sense of it and sift through it. And sometimes more and more contact with people on the far corners of the world, but in the process, as Sherry Turkle was just saying, we lose contact with ourselves. And our machines give us everything except a sense of how to make the wisest use of the machines. The information revolution came without a manual, and so it's up to us, because I assume Thanks to you and many people here, our machines are only going to accelerate and proliferate in the next 15 years. And if we're dizzy now, we'll be 20 times dizzier um, 
15 years from now. You know probably there's a medical condition known as nomophobia, which is terror of being outside of mobile phone contact. Yeah. <laughs> there's internet addiction disorder, there's email apnea, and all those are only going to increase. So it's up to us to try to find some balance because that's the one thing machines won't offer us. And I'm impressed with how you deal with nomophobia with actually a very set ritual year after year. And again, the other paradox I see in you, you claim no sort of spiritual and religious affiliation, yet your parents were, both of them were very famous philosophers. Mm. And you say you don't have a practice, you don't meditate, you don't do yoga, you don't care to do any of this. Yet you spend a substantial amount of each part of the year at the new Kamal Dolly Hermitage yes. in, in complete retreat. Yes. You spend time with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, you're in Dharamsala. Yes. Uh, so tell us about how you create that kind of spaciousness or what would you advise people here in taking those kind of breaks, whether they have a practice or not. Yes, just taking conscious measures. It's not that I don't care to, it's I'm too lazy to. <laughs> I'm too lazy to meditate and I'm too uncoordinated to do yoga, tai chi or qigong. <laughs> so every morning my wife wakes up at 5 a.m. in our little apartment, she meditates, she does tai chi, I watch her and I collapse in an exhausted heap. But on the <laughs> other hand, if my wife were here... But you look at peace, that works. Well, exactly. If, if, if she were here, she would say, all this guy ever does is meditate. Because the beauty of a writer's job is we are paid to essentially sit still for months and years on end, sifting through the distortions, the projections, the delusions in our thought, trying to find the reality behind our thought, entertaining many voices and trying to find what is truer than any single voice. And so every morning I do wake up, I have breakfast, and then I just go and sit there for the rest of the day for months on end. Uh, and probably more than many a person would meditate. A new Kamal Dali is kind of my practice, where I found that silence is my greatest teacher. My colleges taught me a lot about how to speak, but not so much about how to listen, and not so much about how um, to listen to something wiser inside myself than I could ever be. Uh, and what I learned from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, among other things, is you have to earn the title of being a Buddhist or a meditator. It's hard work. And I see how seriously he takes that. And as you know, when he comes to a place like San Francisco, he tells people like us, please don't become a Buddhist. Stay within your own traditions yeah. where your roots are deepest. And you no doubt have much to learn from Buddhists. Buddhists have much to learn from you. But don't clutch or grab at a term that you haven't earned and that perhaps is not ideally suited for you. So that's why I've perhaps erred on the side of shyness in terms of not affiliating myself to any tradition. I don't think I'm worthy of the term Catholic or Buddhist. But I've been so grateful, as you say, um, to be able to spend time with monks who are essentially car engineers of the soul. When I take my Toyota into the garage and it barely can move, people perform some magic and it's ready to go. Yeah. They're doing the same internally. And so to speak about a few of the little measures that I do, for example, thanks to the elastic day I've tried to create for myself in Japan, is I take two long walks every day, and as with you, I think that's really when I get my work done. Most of my writing takes place a long way from the desk. Yeah. I spend at least one hour reading a fairly substantial book, and I can feel, as I emerge from that book, I'm deeper, more attentive, more nuanced. Uh, every evening, I wait for my wife to come back for, from work, and I used to scroll through my emails or roam around websites or watch TV. There's, there's nothing on TV. Which and you can understand. Yes, and I can't understand it anyway because it's in Japanese. I could understand the baseball, so I was tempted to watch that. But then I decided one night just to turn off the lights and listen to music. It could be soothing music, it could be punk music. But I noticed as soon as I began to deactivate some of my senses, when I heard her step on the stairs, I was so much more alive and fresh and so, had so much more to greet her with. I slept better, I woke up less jangled the next morning, and all it really requires is just the choice to um, give yourself a break. And I remember 30 years ago as a traveler when I would tell people about going to Tibet or Cuba, their eyes would light up. Now their eyes light up when I talk about going nowhere or going offline because yeah. anyone here can visit parts of Cuba I could never see in the palm of her hand in her room in the Marriott right. tonight. But having a break in your daily schedule, that seems to be the luxury that's harder and harder for us to get and that we all covet. And so I just tried to create a life minus the cell phone, even though I'm a functioning journalist, in which I felt I could breathe 
and I could make sense of everything that's coming at me from every direction. That is delightful. I think we are out of time. Two so seconds. Oh, no. Yep. No, that's plus So one. one final question. <laughs> <laughs> We're seven seconds over, yeah. Despite being the man who preaches going nowhere at this point, the art of stillness, you must be headed somewhere. What is the next exotic location you're off to? The most exotic place I know is my desk, and that's the, the adventure that never gets old. It's inexhaustible. I never know what's going to come at me, and what's coming at me is coming outside of me. And I suppose, just to wind this up, I feel at some point a doctor is going to come into my room wearing a very grave expression. I'm going to lose somebody I love. A car is going to smash into mine. And when I face that crisis, as we all do, is it my resume, my business card, the trips I've taken to Bolivia and Yemen that's going to help me, or is it the time I've spent collecting myself? And I suspect it's the latter. So I think really it's a sensible investment insofar as a lot of life is about preparing yourself to die. It's easier to do that when you're sitting in one place. Thank you, Pico. It's such a joy having you, you here in Silmar. Thank you.